Hello class, here we are. We're going to go over macroeconomics for exam number five. It's mainly about chapter 15, which is monetary policy. First question, Paul Volcker of the Federal Reserve was faced with stagflation during the late 1970s. He had to decide whether to target the inflation problem or the unemployment problem first. Stagflation is when you have high in unemployment and high inflation at the same time. This scenario is an example of a dilemma and there are trade-offs involved. What Paul Volcker chose to do was target inflation first. He figured by lowering inflation, he would bring stability to the uh, economy, and even though that would increase unemployment in the short run, it would eventually correct unemployment by, by uh, restricting uh, the money supply. Now, question two. If the Fed determines that a small adjustment is needed today to decrease the money supply, then what we're looking for here is a small adjustment so interest rates are out, open market transactions are the right one for small adjustments, and if we want to decrease the money supply, then what we want to do is sell treasuries in the open market because selling treasuries allow the uh, uh, money to come off the money supply or out, off the street and into the Federal Reserve. In fact, selling treasuries on the open market is something that's going to decrease the money supply. So we can fill out this chart right here. Selling treasuries on the open market decreases the money supply. So does raising the required reserve ratio or raising the Fed rate. All of those things have a decreasing effect on the money supply. While we're at it, why don't we complete this chart here by adding to this interest rates, right? And remember, folks, interest rates are the price of money. The price of money is what you have to pay to get it, and interest rates are what you have to do for that. But we're going to add a couple other columns, too. For instance, in this column, we're going to put inflation, also known as the price level. Now, they move in opposite directions because when there's a lot of money available, prices will rise. When there's very little money av available, prices will drop. But the price of money, interest rates, uh, move in a counter direction to inflation in general. We're also going to add unemployment as a category or as a column here, and we'll throw in GDP for good measure as well. Now, if we continue along here, we're going to find that any time that the money supply decreases, that the shortage of money or a decrease in the supply of money causes interest rates to rise. And because there's less money available, the price level will drop. You know, it's, uh, you pay less for cars and houses and things when there's less money available. The decrease in prices and the relative um, shortage of uh, of of money then leads to higher unemployment or upward pressure on unemployment and a decrease in GDP. And this is what uh, the uh, contractionary monetary policy is all about. By decreasing the money supply, you can cause an increase in interest rates, but a decrease in prices, which is, must be what you're concerned about. You must not be too concerned about the effect it's going to have on the GDP. And unfortunately, there's a trade-off whenever we try to combat inflation, which is what uh, Paul Volcker was doing in question one, that it's going to cause an increase in unemployment. So there's our columns right there as we move across. And if we wanted to finish out the chart, we'd say that any of the opposite movements in the money supply could be caused, let's say increase in the money supply, could be caused by lowering the Fed rate, lowering the required reserve ratio, or buying treasuries on the open market. In other words, these three go together, and these three go together. And they're just three different tools of the Fed. The effect on the money supply is opposite, and therefore the effect on interest rates will be opposite as well. The effect on price level will be opposite, unemployment opposite, and GDP opposite. And the same could be true if we filled out the rest of the column. So let's go ahead and uh, fill that out. And we'll just go up and up and up and up. Oh, sorry, down and down. you got to keep it straight. This is really handy. Probably should bring this into your um, uh, study sheet there. And there we go. All right, now let's like look at exhibit F. What word, increase or decrease, should go in place of blank four, up, and five, down? Uh, let me see, increase and decrease. Answer, B. 
refer to the next uh, one here. What does it say? Which numbered line grouping is consistent with expansionary monetary policy? So up, up, up. It goes with buying treasuries. Oh, I'm sorry. It's two, four, and six. There we are. Two, four, six. There we are. B. Recall the in-class demonstration on how banks make the amount of money grow. If you recall that question, we had uh, a person who started off with a thousand dollars, and that thousand dollars was then put in the bank, and that money was then s sent out to borrowers. All right, this person who put their thousand dollars in the bank is called a depositor. Depositor, depositors, banks, and borrowers together create what is called a financial system, and since they already mentioned banks in the first question, the banks cannot do this alone. The other two parties essential to this growth and to the financial system are depositors and borrowers. Right there. When the Fed, number six, when the Fed implements contractionary monetary policy, and here we are, we can go back up to the top here, contractionary monetary policy would be any of these, the effect on the money supply decreases, the interest rates around the world increase, the price level decreases, and unemployment increases. So what are we looking for? Down, up, down, up. Next question. The goldsmiths of yore were antecedents to modern banks in several ways, meaning they, were pro they, they preceded what modern banks are. One of the ways they did is they, they used warehouse receipts to depositors that were traded because they were as good as gold. These receipts are an early example of currency. Very good. Now we move on to the next question. Number eight. All right. Janet Yellen, the chairman of the Fed, chairman of the Fed, has come to you for advice. Well done, because they know you know, she knows you know your stuff. And the economy seems to be slowing down due to a lack of investment and production, along with worrisome escalating unemployment. The problem is supposed to get worse over the next few months. Now, since it's over the few months, we're looking for using the Fed rate. We're not going to mess with the Treasuries, not when it's over a few months. We're certainly not going to mess the reserve ratio or this. So it's either increase the Fed rate or decrease the Fed rate. We can go back to our chart here. We can try to see that changing the Fed rate can either lower the money supply or increase the money supply and the effect is going to change price levels and inflation and also affect unemployment and GDP. We got to see whether the problem, if you will, if the economy is sick one way or is the economy sick the other way. You know, if we're, we're these are the hardest kind of questions to answer because um, you're trying to understand where you are in the business cycle, right? When the economy is moving along nicely, you don't have to fix it at a healthy region. But it gets sick if it's in a slump, in a trough. It's also sick if it's in a boom. They're both both are uh, indications of sickness. So uh, one of the ways that I was thinking about this was a, I saw a student playing a game that was that was similar to this, and they uh, on their little uh, iPad. They had this like, kind of some kind of little bird or something that was moving along, and they had to stroke the bird either up to make it go up, or they had to stroke the bird down to make it go down. It didn't have enough gravity, and if they if they put too much emphasis on the uh, uh, on the little bird that was flying, the bird would die if it crashed into the top of the screen, or it would die if it crashed into the bottom of the screen. The Federal Reserve is kind of like that. It's trying to keep the economy in this narrow band as it rises up. And if, the, if they give it too much expansionary monetary policy, if in other words, while the bird is already climbing this way, if the Fed expands the money supply, it crashes in and it dies, and that's terrible for the economy. In the same way, if, it can, if while the bird is heading down, if, if the Fed causes contractionary monetary policy, it'll crash in the bottom and it'll die as well. What's happening is as the bird rises up, they engage in contractionary monetary policy there. Really, they should do it before it starts to climb up too much. Otherwise, they might be waiting too long. Same way when the bird is starting to climb, move down, they should engage in expansionary monetary policy to try to lift it back up and they try to keep it in that middle section. 
I don't know if you are familiar with games like that, but maybe you've seen something like that before. It's important that that uh, you think about the Fed be using the tools of expansionary and contractionary monetary policy to try to keep the economy healthy, let's say. Now, um, if we get back to the question here, we're trying to tell from the economic indicators whether the economy is uh, sick because it's going too down or whether it's sick because it's going up too fast. And since we have worrisome escalating unemployment, that's a situation that's going down, lack of investment, that's a down, and low production, low GDP, that's a down. So what we need is expansionary. We need to expand, Janet. Need to expand the money supply, Janet. And for that, we have three different tools. All right, and expanding the money supply, if we come back here, buying treasuries will do it, lowering the required reserve ratio will in increase the money supply, and lowering the Fed rate will do it. And given that um, the problem has to do with a few months, we're going to uh, lower the Fed rate. Answer C. Hardest question on the test, but um, on the test what I'll do is I'll ask something along these lines, like, uh, but I'll, I'll either change this so it's not a few months, it's like an immediate concern, or I'll change uh, this part that the worry is not too much unemployment, but too m prices are too high, or I'll change it to uh, that production is too fast, Some, somehow indicate that the economy is, is moving f too fast and needs to be slowed down. In that case, we're going to have to engage in contractionary monetary policy, of which there we have three choices there. The contractionary monetary policies are selling treasuries, uh, raising the required reserve ratio, and raise the Fed rate. So you gotta, you gotta uh, look at the contextual clues, especially the economic indicators, just like the Fed does, and uh, then you can give Janet some good advice. All right. Now, if we go to this next question, this has to do with the bank balance sheet, and and even though it looks like a complicated question, number nine, it's um, a really quite simple. Remember that the reserve uh, ratio is 10% of deposits. All right, since deposits are 180 million, the bank is supposed to be saving 18 million over here on reserve. They're actually holding 20 million in reserve, so that's 2 million more than you need to. Question nine, what is the amount, if any, of excess reserves for the bank above? Answer, 2 million. Number 10. All other things being equal among the banks below, which bank is the most likely to become insolvent or bankrupt? Now here we got five banks, A, B, C, D, and E, and each one of them is having problems, if you will. Um, or actually, they're all healthy. I'm sorry. <laughs> all five of them are healthy because they've all got assets which exceed their liabilities. However, when bad times come and the economy starts to slide, assets could uh, lose value. And if the uh, assets lose value, the bank will still owe the liabilities that they owe, but their value of their assets will decline. And when we take a look at it, let's say that if there was a 10%, um, maybe a 10% decline, then that would mean that this bank, A, would lose 10% and it would only have 90 million. But it would still be okay. 90 million is more than 80 million. It would still be solvent. It would not be bankrupt. So bank A is, seems to be okay. Let's try these other ones. If this bank were to lose 10%, it would lose 20 million of its assets. And so it would be down to 180. So with this one. And so with this one. So now we have three banks that would all drop to 100. 80 million in assets, but they would have 170, 180, 150. In other words, this one is right on the brink of bankruptcy. If it drops more than 10%, anything more than one dollar more than 10%, and Bank C is insolvent. So Bank C is our best choice so far. Let's see what happens if Bank E loses 10%. 10% of 40 million is 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 for, uh, 400 million is 40 million. So that would mean it would only have 360 million left. It's got 340 million in liabilities. It's safe. Therefore, C is the correct answer. It's the one that would go bankrupt before the other four would. Number 11. When the Fed reduces the money supply by selling treasury securities, where does the money go? Answer, uh, the money is taken out of the economy completely. Some of it is stored in vaults. 
What would happen to the local economy if natural gas was permitted to be drilled in the area of New York State where it's abundant? Well, for that one, I'm going to just bring over here because there's a similar question on the test that I might ask you about, and that is about the wild, wild west. That's right. There's a, uh, maybe you're familiar with the gold rush in San Francisco during the 49ers. They found gold in them in our hills, and they seemed like the unlimited, inexhaustible gold mines, and that led to huge advances in California. That's right. There was a major, major benefit in California when the gold was discovered. It led to high prices, and it led to uh, um, high GDP in the immediate area, and it also led to uh, low unemployment because there were so many jobs created by not only mining but also all the things that uh, uh, helped support mining, uh, the uh, clothing and the housing and the food and the tools and everything else and explosives and railroads and shipping and everything else. So, so it was a huge boon to the economy. But if you think about it, gold itself was just an money that was in the ground that they didn't know about. And when they pulled the money out of the ground, then that was an increase in the money supply, which led to higher prices, higher GDP, and low unemployment, which, when you think about it, is exactly what we see over here. Any increase in the money supply leads to those positive pieces. So you can either get growth in the economy and higher GDP from uh, discovery of new technologies or new resources like the gold or oil, like in this question, or simply by increasing the money supply, like we've seen here. Well, to answer the question, if natural gas were permitted to be drilled in the area of New York State where it's abundant, we would find that um, we're looking for unemployment will decrease. So we're going to cross that one off. Unemployment will decrease. So it's going to be one of these things. This is probably a gag answer right there. Let's take a look. It's either B or C. Productivity will increase. Good, that's true. Price level will, well, prices will rise, actually. So it's going to be choice B. Tax revenue will increase. Yes. Unemployment will decrease. Yes. Productivity will increase and price level will increase. Question 13. Which of these Fed actions would decrease the money supply by $100 billion? Well, here what we're looking for is a change in amount of, of uh, only $10 billion because of the multiplier effect. So $10 billion, $10 billion. It's not going to be that one. It's not going to be that one. It's not going to be that one. So it's either buy $10 billion in treasuries or sell $10 billion in treasuries. And since we want to decrease the money supply, we go back to our chart and we see that when we sell or buy treasuries, the one that's going to decrease the money supply is selling treasuries. So we'll go back to here and selling 10 billion in treasuries is the correct answer for number 13. And now we go to 14. Which of the following statements is consistent with the Phillips curve? And remember the Phillips curve states that the government faces a short run trade-off between inflation and unemployment. Question 15. What's the velocity of money? It is how rapidly the multiplier takes full effect um, because how many times the uh, uh, it's a measure of how quickly the, the money supply uh, circulates through the economy. Question 16, when the Fed engages in expansionary monetary policy, all things being equal, the result will most likely be a increase. Okay, so it's not this one because it's an increase in the money supply, expansionary monetary policy. There will be an increase in unemployment. It's a decrease in unemployment. The price level will increase. Yeah, that's a downside to that, like the Phillips curve said. So the answer is D for 16. A barter economy has many advantages. What are two major disadvantages of barter? Uh, the double coincidence of wants and high transaction costs is the answer. Number 18, what purpose does money serve when comparing the price of an iPhone and an Android? In that particular case, it's a way of thinking about um, the unit of account, the value of, uh, of an iPhone versus the value of an Android using money as a way of measuring value. And then uh, question 19. The Capitol Hill Babysitting Co-op adopted Scrip as currency for its members. Everything worked smoothly until members began to hoard Scrip. And when they started to hoard the script, that led to a recession. And uh, it also led to unemployment because people that were trying to get business, uh, trying to get babysitting gigs couldn't because people were hoarding their script. The problem was solved by simply issuing a few extra script to all members. Answer E. And number 20. Under what circumstances would it be prudent for the Fed to implement contractionary monetary policy? 
So here we are with the business cycle. We know that if they had implemented contractionary monetary policy here or here, that would have been appropriate. So we could say it's the beginning of the peak of the business cycle would be a good answer. Now we look for 21. 